Hey, Tom here, Flip Anything USA. So today, gonna do a quick review on Tyler Cobble. He's a gentleman that has some commercial real estate experience. I read just a little bit about him. I think he's been an agent for 10 years or maybe 20 years, and he has some strong opinions on commercial property. It seems to be his expertise as a realtor. I don't know how he bets out as a investor, but you know, that's what I like to look at. And so I'm gonna watch this video here and I'll make some comments as we go along. I may speed him up just a little bit. So uh, he's at normal speed right now, but I may bump him up just a little bit. So we'll go ahead and get started. All right, I'm caffeinated and excited because today we're going to be diving into what I think is the easiest commercial real estate asset for anyone to own. Whether you are a beginner or you're an advanced investor, flex space is basically the equivalent of five plexes in multifamily. But Hamza, tell us what flex space is because I know that there's some confusion out there as to what it is and sometimes isn't. I would say an easy entry for any beginner. Think about a single story, single family home. I would compare uh, flex space equivalent to that in the in the world of commercial real estate. What flex space allows you to do is it basically allows you to build these small metal buildings and you can have multiple tenants within one building. There is a huge demand right now um, and we just can't keep up. I'm going to do something that I haven't seen anyone. So look, I'm going to give you a different definition of flex space because I own a lot of it. In fact, I can actually show you some of it too. Uh, let me open up Google Earth here. But so, so flex space is... It's kind of a hybrid space, I like to consider it. It's it's something between office and industrial. And so, like, I'll show you actually one the very first property I ever bought when I was 19 years old, right? So I'm going back here, 43 years. This would be a flex space. So this is a, uh, you can see I got industrial buildings next to me. And that's kind of what it is. In the back here, I had uh, 3,500. 3,500 square foot back here, 2,400 square foot kind of office up here. So both were rough, in other words. But like this back part, it wasn't insulated. But the front part was insulated for office. But generally, a flex space to me is one that's like industrial building that is insulated. Because if it's an insulated, then you can, you know, you can heat it, you can cool it. You can make it comfortable for people to walk in an office environment or if it's a carpet store, people can come in and walk in, you know, have that kind of that warehouse feel. So I love flex space. Like I say, all these properties I bought in my early 20s, that's a flex space, right? Little corner property, got a roll-up door. That was like 4,400 square feet. I made, made $105,000 on that building too. But uh, these, these are the kinds of buildings. Here's another one here. Actually, I actually flipped this one. I did an assignment on this one a long time ago. And, and these are like, this is going long, back a long time ago. And this is actually another building right here. You can see. But these are all what I would call flex spaces. They were insulated industrial buildings that could go either way. In other words, you could have a very rough, uh, you know, you could have something where you're spraying water. You could have, you know, you could have sandblast inside these things or you can clean them up and you, know, you could throw a little carpet carpeting down if you wanted to and you can actually kind of use them as office so a flex space to me is one that can be used for both industrial and office or light industrial is actually another good way to put it and so uh, and i'll show you some that i even still own today uh, this is a twenty thousand square foot flex space it's industrial kind of an industrial building it's in a little bit of a retail area but you can't really take advantage it doesn't quite have the parking that you would need for a retail requirement but nevertheless still a great functioning space again it's it's kind of office warehouse kind of an office warehouse combination you know like here's another building this is more of a retail center here but, but for a while there i kind of utilize it as a little bit of a flex space i still own this property that's 8800 square feet you know if you get down on it this has got pretty darn good location a lot of drive-by traffic right plus i got this fantastic uh, overpass and freeway right next to it too so I, I anyways i own a lot of flex space okay and and actually one of my other favorite buildings is right down here this is a really nice flex space right here. This is really, really, really nice, actually. This one's 20,000 square feet. You can see I got a little glass here. Got some roll-up doors in the back, back way back there. Again, a couple more side entrances. Uh, good access all the way around the building because that's what you want with an industrial property is access all the way around. And a flex space also very, very convenient to have. But again, and, and like across the street from this, I own property that is not flex space, that is office. See this? This is office, right? Right, so this is where you're like your medical office, that type of stuff. Again, so but let's get back onto the flex space and hear a little bit more about Tyler I say. What else do on YouTube? And we're gonna actually dive into every single aspect of the deal and break down the numbers from land acquisition to rental rates so that you can go out there and confidently build or buy one of these assets yourself. What kind of 
So I, would, I wouldn't recommend building ever. Let me tell you something. The thing that really makes me different than most real estate mentors is that I have a very high standard of making money. In other words, I try not to buy anything for more than 40% under market. All, all these buildings that you see, all these buildings, they're, they're worth, you know, twice what I paid for them on, on average, some much more because time's gone by. But so let, let's keep watching. What kind of tenant base do you typically find in flex space? Most people, I think, get intimidated and think these are industrial manufacturing guys who... Yeah, that is not, that is that is overkill. That's not a flex space that you're looking at there. That is a warehouse. You know, are coming in and doing heavy lifting. And it's really not the case. Pickleball is probably now the number one most desired tenant to have in a flex space because all they're really looking for is empty space. Last year, or the year before rather, it was um, podcast studios. We've seen daycares, we've seen boxing, gyms, CrossFit gyms, uh, you know, we have swimming pool companies, uh, lawnmower repair facilities. Anything that might need a little bit of warehouse or wide open space in addition to their offices. So look, I've got a nuclear physicist. I've got a petroleum engineering company in a flex space. You know, I've had coffee distributors. I've had software engineers. I've had uh, robotics companies that had a little, you know, they, they, they like to be comfortable when they're putting those robots together. A lot of different people in flex space, movie making equipment, uh, really it's all over the place but like i say that's accurate descriptions people that like need a little bit of space but in other words they're not expecting company they're not really expecting people to come in and not a showroom not a showroom necessarily i've had many gyms in my flex space as well so gyms certainly agree with that but uh, let's keep watching and may or may not have loading docks but probably do have larger roll-up doors so that businesses can move product in and out yeah so like i say a, a loading dock is especially important for a warehouse and a lot of properties that, that really qualify for flex space are ones that don't have a loading dock, but they nevertheless have some capacity to for storage and, again, for stuff that you can drag stuff in and not worry about damaging the floor. Uh, a, lot, a lot of spaces like that. Like I say, kind of a, uh, you got a certain amount of office and warehouse. Depending on their needs. And you probably guessed that it is very creatively named because of how flexible the uses are within this asset. Talk to us about the, the vacancy and demand rates for this type of product. I like to see them being built in high growth corridors, meaning brand new neighborhoods where land is abundant and still relatively. Yeah, he's pushing the to build, which I don't agree with. Let's keep watching. Being expensive so that the numbers work and the deal makes sense, right? Now, one thing that you may or may not know is that flex space is actually one of the most in demand commercial real estate products out there. Aside from affordable housing, vacancy rates in flex space are unbelievably low. In fact, they're probably at historic lows today. And that's because we cannot build flex space fast enough to accommodate the tenants that are taking them. How do you make them? So let me give you another take on that. So with flex space, here's the beauty of flex space. If you and I've got some really well located flex space, now it's still in a warehouse, still a warehouse type building, it doesn't have retail parking, right? You kind of get this hybrid tenant that like is a little bit industrial and a little bit retail. Now, what's that mean? It means you're going to get more for the property than you would for warehouse, but less than you would get for retail. So you kind of got that. It's in the middle. It's in the middle. It's right between warehouse and retail. That's it, it gets you that number. But what's nice is you're kind of getting that higher number out of a warehouse that you probably paid a lower number for. So that's one of the, the coolest things about FlexSpace. Make the numbers work on a FlexSpace deal. Like when you say you know, we're looking for cheaper land. What does that mean to you? To make it very simple, criteria is extremely simple, right? Land needs to be below $5 a square foot. You need to have at least an acre um, for the numbers. Yeah, so he's got some general fundamentals, I guess, for, for building, and, and I get that. But again, it just kind of depends on where you're at. It has a huge impact. And that's why I prefer not to build. And I'm, I'm, bu and I'm a builder. I built many buildings. I built some of the ones I just showed you in, in a little bit ago. But where I'm trying to show you is the ideal is you buy an existing property because then you can buy it for less than it costs to build in many cases imagine buying a property for less than it costs to build the building it's like getting the land for free that's what i push and that's what i teach my students which if you haven't seen uh, my flip anything usa uh, is my channel right flip anything usa and i'm taking you to the website here and what you'd see if you come in here is you'll see i've got a number of students that i've, I've transitioned them from making money in land and re and, and homes uh, to offices and warehouses and in retail centers, strip centers. And ultimately that's where I'd like everybody to land. Like my students are like Jerry here. He, you know, he's got about it. He's got about a three and a half million dollar building for 975,000. Josh out here, which I may start actually investing with him. He's made over a million dollars in land and
and uh, you know all, all these people you see here they're all flipping properties of different types but ultimately the goal is to get them to uh, you know flipping land flipping houses and then rolling those retail and, and land assets into a commercial flex space or you know retail strip center in fact uh, my student here so rich is a great example went uh, toward the principal. So Rich here is 34 years old, and, you know, he really, really, everything played out very, very well. He, he you know, he made it's over a million dollars in, within the first 18 months of being in the class, and he was able to buy some of my retail centers there. But so Purchase he, of he, uh, two properties that totaled uh, $2.3 million, right? Yeah. yeah. Two point three million, and so now he's got ten grand a month coming in. One of the nice things is I've got a new real estate. So, so Rich there basically matched his income. We've got about one hundred and thirty thousand a year coming in from his assets. That that he, these are new assets that he just he made this money just in the last eighteen you know months to twenty four months. You know he's made over a million dollars, realized over a million dollars cash between three land deals, and that's where he started. And now really he's following my footsteps almost exactly by rolling those big profits from those you know land and, and small residential assets and rolling those into commercial industrial flex space anyways go to flip anything usa.com and also hey hit that subscribe button while you're here don't want to lose my channel if you got an interest in commercial industrial uh, you want to build a portfolio i've got over 200,000 square feet of rentals myself and i got some really really beautiful properties and you'll, you'll learn all about those and 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 you'll maybe be like my students and start acquiring those kinds of assets yourself so anyway let's go ahead and get back to tyler numbers to work so one acre below five bucks a foot um, and then you need to build at least 10,000 square feet. Anything more than that is, I would say, just added value that you are going to benefit off of. But let's get into the numbers of this deal. I'm going to break it down from a build and development perspective. If you want to skip ahead to buying these assets in as is condition, check out the timestamp at the bottom of the screen. But I yeah, that's where we're going to jump to, because I can tell you, folks, you're going to make more money buying property under market than you're ever going to do building especially in these times right now, interest rates are so high. It's very, very difficult. But you can always make money. Listen, I've been buying money every year for 43 years. Believe me, there's been some very, very rough downturns in the last four decades. Realistic exit considering today's interest rate environment and market conditions. Now, depending on where you are located, it could be a little bit lower, it could be a little bit higher, but when I'm running my underwriting, I like to assume that we're gonna be in the middle of the road, right? So 7% is probably what you should underwrite and expect to hit as you're exiting these assets. Now, if you're buying these assets, you'll want to make sure that there is some room for value add, right? Because you can't really afford to pay a 7% cap rate with interest rates at seven to 8% and expect to make any spread unless you're planning on paying all cash. Yeah, so I right off the bat, I can tell you, a seven cap is far too low of a standard. You know, I, I always push for like a nine and a half, and that's even when you know I can borrow money at six. So I try to even push for higher now. You know, you can buy money in. I mean, when I was buying assets in the beginning in the in the nineteen eighties, interest rate was ten percent, and the, but the cap rate in general we were getting twelve to fifteen percent. So and that's what it should be. There should be a, a very decent delta between what your cap rate is and and what your Paying for the building, you, you got to have a very big margin there. You should always have, you know, about a, a 12, 15 percent cap rate in these times right now, where interest rates are so high. It just doesn't make sense. What's hurting everybody right now is the interest rate changed too quickly. So we got some catching up to do. And, and as much as people have to start making more money, it's really the only thing you can do to fix this kind of inflation that we have right now. Is people just have to start making more money. So let's keep watching. Now that value add could be from filling up new tenants, raising rental rates, and more of your operational side of things, or it could be adding another building to the property and leasing that up as well. The good Yeah, so listen, building is just not as friendly. Listen, I'm a builder, okay? You know, I build hundreds of thousands of square feet of buildings, and I can tell you, it's just a pain in the ass. You know, I just pulled a permit and just got it final the other day, and it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad, a little remodel, but uh, it, you know, the, just, the cities are not as builder-friendly as they used to be. You know, they talk about affordable housing, but they're really not talking about people that pay for stuff. They, when they talk about when do things for affordable housing, they used to talk about people that don't have any money to pay for anything. So they kind of ignore the middle class that actually that really that needs affordable housing. Good thing is that a lot of your due diligence on flex warehousing should be fairly simple if the product is newer because a lot of landlords are going to a triple net style lease, meaning the tenants are responsible for their share of the common area maintenance. The so you got to go triple net. And I'm going to go back here to my portfolio, just see some other assets. So look, you know, I've got 
like I say, on all these properties, every one of these properties, these are all my personal assets. Some of these I've sold, most I still own. And so you can see I have everything. I've got houses, I've got warehouses, I've got commercial, I've got medical office, I've got food parks, trailer parks, just about everything you can imagine. And the thing is, building is just, I mean, and here's another thing. Let's, let me just give you a building. Take a look at this building right here. This is a building that was built in the 80s. And you can see I've got plenty of parking here, a little bit of grass in the back. What is noticeably missing here? Water detention. Because when they were building some of these buildings back, you know, 40 years ago, they didn't have the water detention requirement that you have on a new building. So now you go look at like a new building. Let me find a new building here. Yeah, like here's a new building. And the difference is, is that you have to have water collection. They've got actually big water collection in the back here. Got a little bit here on the right here. Uh, and I, actually, I have another building I actually built. So look, I built this building back in 2000. You can't really see it. Every drop of water that, that runs off of this, this roof is collected and it goes into a, you can't really see it. You can see a little bit right there, right? See that? There's a, there's a big pit here. I call it a, a detention pond. And basically every bit of water that runs off this building is collected and it is all plumbed back. Everything comes off this, this uh, parking lot. Everything goes inside this detention pond right there. And, uh, and believe me, it's a pain in the ass because now you have to give up more property for that detention pond. Uh, you know, I've got twin stainless steel pumps that pump at the bottom of a kind of a sub well system that pumps it, takes water across the street. You can see how, where I cut this out 20 years ago and it runs over here. And then this, this is the overflow to something else so listen building is not for newbies it's really it's becoming even less and less popular for anybody even if you've been a builder before you, you know what i'm talking about it's a pain in the ass it's just not if you've been doing it for a long time you know it's just it's not as good as it used to be but the other thing is this here you have so much more to do on the land that you didn't have to do or that you won't have to do you, know, you didn't have to do it when you were building 30 40 years ago but but now and I built that 20-something years ago and had to go through that stuff. But you go back 30, 40 years ago, by existing buildings, you will not have near the detention. You can see this building here. All this is water detention. You can kind of see, see how these little water, these little sub walls and things go in here and the water comes and runs around? That is a detention pond. I have one. Mine's hidden in the trees there. But the older buildings don't have that. I like, like this 20,000-square-foot building I have across the street right there, right? No water detention, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing. If you can get something that's pre-existing, save a lot of money and you'll make a lot more money as well, by the way. So let's keep listening. The property taxes and the building insurance. So if you're coming from multifamily into flex warehousing, you don't have to worry about your insurance rates going up like they have over the past year. You don't have to worry if the property taxes go up. Those costs get passed directly through to the tenants. So that's not exactly true. I'm just going to tell you right now. Listen, if you have your taxes raised significantly on a building, I've had buildings where they've raised my taxes. She's like uh, 40 grand, you know, on a 20,000 square foot building. So simply passing that tax burden to the tenant is not as easy as saying, hey, your rent's going up four grand a month this month. It, it doesn't work. So it sounds good. Triple nets are great. And, and, I, and I have triple nets on nearly all my properties where you are passing the costs of, you can have insurance, you can, you know, some, some, some people don't extend it to every aspect, but you usually almost always cover property taxes because those can fluctuate and insurance. And some even put in management. Some people even take a piece of your action. They, they'll, they'll take, you know, triple net lease that includes taking a piece of your gross receipts. So, but for practicality, what I wanted to say is, what, what Tyler just said, it's not as easy as just passing, you know, oh, everything went up, you just pass it to your tenants. It's not that way because you'll your tenants will get it and they're like, we're out of business. We can't do it. So it's important, important as a landlord that you be very proactive in keeping your property taxes down, keeping your insurance costs down. And you have to, I fight, listen, I fight, I spent a significant amount of my life fighting property tax assessors, right? Keeping the value of my portfolio down. You know, they don't care. They just, computer kind of just throws shit on the wall and then they want you to scrape it off. And, and that's what you got to do to keep your, your cost down. So anyways, I would just, just tell you, Tyler, sounds good. And maybe you'll qualify it here a little better, but it's not that easy. It's just passing it through. So your base rent is what you are going to collect and what you can count on for the next three to five to 10 years, depending on how long your leases are. What do people often get wrong? about flex space. As an investor, what people often get wrong is they get intimidated by the fact that it is commercial real estate and they think it must be difficult to get into. So I'm gonna go ahead and buy four more houses and deal with four more tenants and four more roofs and four more HVACs. Yeah, here's the deal. It, it really is, 
I, I wouldn't label it to just one fear. People that just fear the unknown. If you've never done it, you're concerned. If you know, I have in my class, I have you know, many, many people in my class. That's what they want to do. They want to transition from residential and land to commercial assets, and that's what I help them do all the time. But what I was going to say is, a lot of times, you, somebody comes in, they have an opportunity to buy like a, a, an empty building. They're like freaked out because they're like. Who, will somebody rent this? Who would rent that? Who would rent that? And the fact is, there is a tenant for every building. I promise you that. And, you know, it's it's good to have, like, and this is the beauty of having a mentor, by the way, is when people, they have the ability to contact me. Uh, and, and so, in other words, there's so many things that you go through over four decades of doing this stuff that, uh, you know, you couldn't even write them all down. Nobody even would want to read every scenario and problem that can happen. But they certainly want an answer when that went problem does arise and, and that's the beauty of mentorship you can call somebody like me if you you know if i'm your mentor and then i can tell you what to do or how to handle it or whether to worry about it or not and, and a lot of times you know you come into phase one phase two inspections for you know, environmental stuff and but but don't let that scare you because that's what i own mostly right I, everything i've gone through many houses tons of land and ultimately the stuff that i hold on to is my flex space my retail space office buildings those sorts of things. And I think that is where they get everything wrong, um, which is why I took it upon myself, you know, to start social media, get on YouTube, get on TikTok, get on Instagram, and talk about all of these things and show people that, look, these are my tenants. I actually go and have a conversation with them. And this is the business that they do it with. And believe it or not, I think I've changed quite a few minds, um, as have you. And uh, I think we'll continue to do that, man, as we, as we progress. Now, having gone into all of that with Hamza today, you know, I'm, I'm, Tyler's new to me, and the other guy I don't know. But uh. I think that FlexSpace is by far the easiest commercial real estate investment to own. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and if you want to learn more about development, so you can do these projects on. I, I wouldn't say it's it, it's same. It's right. In other words, it is commercial. So look, I have retail buildings, you know, like vape shops, liquor store, bars, restaurant dry cleaners, tattoo shop, secondhand stores, all, all, you know, and no matter what, I have almost the same kind of tenants everywhere. I have one of those retail strip centers, uh, 15 to 20 something thousand square feet. I always have the same general. I always got a vape shop, tattoo shop, massage parlor. It's just kind of normal, but it's wonderful because you can have these every two blocks and they're full because they, they're like commercial services, right? They service the neighborhood with these kinds of things. And they can, they're kind of Amazon proof, which I really like a lot. I hear me talk a lot about Amazon proof with me and my students. You want you kind of want tenants and properties that won't be wiped out by Amazon because they do. They wipe a lot of people out. Uh, and that's why I have many schools. You know, I have jujitsu schools. I'm also a big fan of jujitsu. I'm a brown belt myself this year. So, and by the way, learning a martial art is, is really not much different than, than learning how to be an investor in real estate. In other words, there's just varying degrees of skills. Every one of those levels can take you to where you ultimately want to be. In other words, you can make money. You don't have to know everything to start making money, but the more you know, the more you can make and the more opportunities you'll recognize. So uh, anyways, hey, good job, Tyler and uh, Hamza, and enjoyed uh, reviewing this deal. And uh, for those of you that are new to me, please uh, hit that subscribe button and uh, take a look at Flip Anything USA. Uh, you can also, uh, you can get in and have a free phone call with me. Uh, just go to uh, Flip Anything USA right here. You can go apply for mentorship, webinar. But really easiest thing is that also I've got a book. Be sure to get my book. You definitely want to get my book. It's be the best investments you could make for, for the dollar for dollar. Many, many great reviews on it. You can read those reviews as well. But number one, hit that apply for mentorship and I'll text you back and we can have a free phone call. I'll be happy to talk to you about your portfolio. I don't care if it's multi-million or, you know, maybe just, you know, a few thousand. That's okay. I'm here to help. I'm doing it a long time and uh, that's kind of what I want my legacy to be is what it's become over the last few years is helping uh, men and women find a path to retirement, find a path to putting their kids through school, all the normal stuff, the American dream. Anyways, thanks for watching. Stop and listen. listen. Time is on a mission to eliminate all the snake oil and the fake gurus that fake y'all. And we'll show you how to build an empire, starting with nothing but a desire. All you really need is a good mentor, not a used car bullshit. With time, you'll learn to crush it. Investing like Warren Buffett. With real estate, you cannot procrastinate. Everyone who hesitates is left at the starting gate. Hey, yo, so don't delay and join today. The mentorship and flip. Anything you will say, go.